All right, AAS press conference now with 30% fewer technical difficulties we have. Yeah, all right. All right, by my watch, it is time to get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. It is Monday, June 5th here in Albuquerque, 2.15 p.m., and we are here for our second of two press conferences of the day. This afternoon, we'll be hearing about solar swirls, satellites, and saving the night sky. My name is Carrie Hensley. I'm the AAS Deputy Press Officer, and I am joined today by Susanna Kohler, the AAS Press Officer, and Ben Concess, our AAS Media Fellow. So despite what you may see on stage, we're actually going to be hearing from four presenters. This afternoon, two of them are joining us virtually. So basically how this is going to work is we're going to hear from our speakers in order, starting here, going back to our virtual speakers, and then follow, uh, finishing everything up in the room. Um, and we will have Q&A for all of our speakers at the end. So please hold your questions, uh, queue those up until the end, until we're ready to ask them of everyone. Sorry, I have far too many papers up here. So as I said, our, the topic of this press conference is solar swirls, satellites, and saving the night sky. So this morning, we started with some of the most distant known galaxies in the universe, seen with JWST. And this afternoon, we're bringing things considerably more down to Earth, as close as Earth, or Earth orbit. Our first speaker here in the room is going to be Juana Vesa from New Mexico State University speaking on characterizing tornadoes on the sun. There's at least one person in the room is like, I didn't know I had to worry about tornadoes on the sun. Then we'll move out to one of our virtual presenters and hear from Justin Albert at the University of Victoria speaking on Orcasat and calibrating Earth-based telescopes from space. Our third presenter will be David Stark of the Space Telescope Science Institute, speaking on improved detection of satellite trails in Hubble imaging. And then to wrap things up back here in the room, we'll hear from James Lowenthal from Smith College and the AAS Compass Light Pollution Subcommittee, speaking on Flagstaff, Arizona and Coconina County, showing how to save the night sky for astronomy, people and nature. So before we get started, I'd like to invite everyone to please silence your cell phones um, and anything else that might make noise. And thank you so much to everyone joining us virtually on Zoom. You're gonna be using the Q&A feature to queue up your questions. Uh, so please feel free to type those in whenever you're ready. All right, so I will get your presentation slides up and then we'll get ready to go. Okay, hello everyone. So I kind of messed up um, the naming of this press conference by changing my title, but um, solar swirls or chromospheric swirls are just are just solar tornadoes. So today I will briefly I will briefly highlight my research about solar tornadoes, and I just want to quickly acknowledge that this work has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the New Mexico Space Grant Consortium. Okay, so the solar environment is highly conducive to a variety of these swirling, whirlpool-like rotating motions, um, similar to solar tornadoes. So solar tornadoes are anchored to the surface of the sun to something we call a magnetic bright point, which are these bright spots that are small and they're, they hold um, kilogauss concentrations of magnetic fields. Um, and unlike Earth-based tornadoes, unlike columns of swirling air, the rotating motion that we see with these solar tornadoes is a result of magnetic field lines being twisted around in a spiral shape and dragging the plasma or ionized gas around with it. Um, so the figure on the slide is an illustration of what a solar tornado looks like. Um, so you can see that's anchored to the surface of the sun and there's a blue arrow that indicates a rotational motion. And at the same time, um, these tornadoes not only rotate, they also propagate upwards through the solar atmosphere. So they're able to channel mass and energy um, to different layers of the solar atmosphere. These tornadoes range from the size of a small city to about planet-sized. 
um, and they can last from minutes to hours. And my research focuses on a particular category of solar tornadoes um, that we call small scale solar tornadoes or chromospheric swirls, um, named for the region when they were discovered. These tornadoes um, were discovered in 2008. So it's a relatively new field. Um, so because we are in Albuquerque, I do wanna highlight that all these observations were taken uh, with the Dunn Solar Telescope in Sunspot, New Mexico. Um, and we study these tornadoes by basically imaging a relatively small area of the sun. Um, however, if I were to put the earth on the sun, uh, the earth would just be a peppercorn. Um, so it's, it's a relatively small, small region comparison to the sun. And from there, um, we, can, um, we, we can see this chromospheric uh, region. And from there, we can look for swirling motions in order to identify these tornadoes. So on the slide, on the, the third panel, I have a, an example of, a, of one of our largest, most brilliant spiral-shaped solar tornadoes. Um, and I have the Earth drawn to scale. And so you can see that it is a little bit bigger than the diameter of Earth. And so the Dunn Solar Telescope, we were able to find 84 solar tornadoes in four different data sets. Um, and in one data set alone, we found over 41 candidates. And so this um, we found much more tornadoes than have been previously discovered um, in the past. And from the sample set, we're able to track 33 of these tornadoes all the way from the surface of the sun up to about 1,500 kilometers above the sun's surface. So what I'm learning is that tornadoes come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and from our data set, we were able to broadly classify them into three distinct shapes. Um, we have circular like shapes, which you can see all the way to the left. Um, then we have the most distinct spiral like shape, which is a really common shape we find in nature. And then we have something that we call complex shaped because it's not a, it's not, it's not a circle and it's not a spiral. And we have no idea what's going on, but there clearly is some rotation associated with these events. We find no preferential shape um, for these tornadoes, but we do find that um, spiral shaped tornadoes are not that common. Um, we, in our, our sample set, our tornadoes, the average diameter is about 2,400 miles. Our smallest tornado is about the distance of you were to travel from Albuquerque, New Mexico to Nashville, Tennessee. So that's around a thousand miles. And our largest is a little bit more than the, the radius of the earth. And we find that these tornadoes have an average lifetime of around seven to eight minutes. So they are relatively short lived and we're seeing a trend in that smaller tornadoes um, have shorter lifetimes. Um, so our solar tornadoes also exhibit a wide range of complex dynamics. Um, so I mentioned previously that these are magnetic in nature. However, we find that 15% of our tornadoes show no magnetic foot point, foot, footprints on, on the surface of the sun. And so this raises a lot of questions regarding their magnetic nature, how they're able to maintain that sort of sw swirling motion. Um, and it also raises a lot of uh, questions about the orientation. Right now, we're just assuming that we're, they're just in, inclined purely vertically. However, it could be that they're sort of meandering their way through the solar atmosphere at an angle. Um, we also find that our tornadoes seem to appear and disappear. So we're seeing tornadoes that appear for a couple minutes and then disappear and that appear minutes later. We're also seeing tornadoes that appear in one area and then disappear and then another tornado appears in the same area, but with slightly different characteristics and shapes. And we also found um, something that we call twin tornadoes. So while most of our tornadoes seem to not be interacting with any nearby uh, tornadoes in their environment, these tornadoes are clearly interacting with one another. So the figures on this slide show the evolution of a pair of tornadoes that we call a twin tornado. And so uh, the, the timestamps show the time from the, the start of these tornadoes lifetime. So you can see that we start off with two tornadoes in the first um, image. And then um, as we go over to the right, we can see that there's a sort of 
they're, they're sort of feeding off of one another. I liken this to a sort of ping pong effect. One becomes prominent, then one disappears, then all of a sudden we see both of them in the same slide, and then one just disappears, and at the very end, only one is left. And so we just, we honestly don't understand what's going on here. So I mentioned this is a relatively new field. It was discovered in 2008 by Sven uh, Wedemeyer. And so the evolution information of these tornadoes is still largely unknown. Um, however, my contribution is that we're greatly increasing, in fact, almost doubling the sample size of clear examples of these chromospheric swirls or solar tornadoes. Um, and there's an estimated 11,000 of these tornadoes that are supposed to be visible on the surface of the sun at any given moment. However, we do not see this many. And so I'm seeing a really large amount of solar tornadoes um, in our in our data sets that have never been, uh, the, the quantity of which have not been seen. And one of the implications of these events and that we're interested in pursuing is um, previous literature has shown that some larger scale solar tornadoes um, are the legs of prominences, which are these large loop-like structures of plasma. And you, you can see this in the, in the figure on the slide. Um, and there's also the earth for comparison. And so these prominences are rooted to the surface of the sun and they extend outwards through the sun's corona or the outermost uh, atmospheric region of the sun. And as these tornadoes sort of rotate, um, so, a really good example is if you think of a rubber band, it, you can pull a rubber band and you could stretch it, but at one point there's so much tension it snaps. And so this is something that happens. And so this prominence snaps and it can trigger coronal mass ejections, uh, which um, unleash plasma at really high speeds into space. And coronal mass ejections do have the ability to, um, to affect our satellite and communication systems. So, uh, this is my conclusion slide, so I'm going to end with this, but I just want to say that sol honestly, solar tornadoes are really complex, um, and we were able to identify over 84 potential uh, candidates. All right, Justin, if you want to go ahead and bring up your slides, we will... Stop sharing. Oh no, where'd that go? <laughs> I hid the controls too well and now they're gone. There we go. I... Uh, and David, yeah, there we go. Perfect. One moment if you wait for us. So we just want to make it so that everyone in the room can see well. That looked good. Sorry, it's so hard for me to see from up here. Um, no, although that's a great idea. Yeah, do you do you just want to make that full screen? We can we can see your yeah, I could. Um, I, I, it, 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 it's not going to get much bigger full screen. Okay. It'll make it a little more difficult to, to switch between. Oh, no worries then. All right, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. So the, um, so I'll start by saying that the, um, the next two um, presentations, um, the, the last one I'll, I'll, um, I'll reference uh, later, um, but excellent presentation by, um, but on, uh, on solar swirls, but um, I'll start by prefacing um, the, the next two after this are going to be um, for, um, for a, so a low-level um, explanation, you can you can view most satellites in the night sky as uh, somewhat like the evil empire in Star Wars. Um, I, the, the, they cause trouble for um, for astronomy, both um, ground-based astronomy and uh, from low Earth orbit, like uh, Hubble. Um, you get streaks. From uh, from uh, from satellites, uh, from the solar reflections off of satellites, for example, uh, being that they're some of the most numerous satellites, um, the SpaceX's Starlink satellites um, are a 
uh, chronic offender um, in uh, for astronomy um, in that regard. Um, so um, that's a little bit like uh, a little bit like the evil empire. But then um, there are some uh, some uh, uh, just one right now, um, but soon hopefully there'll be a few um, uh, of. Um, the uh, satellites that can be thought of as the good rebel alliance um, in this, not directly competing, of course, or fighting with the evil empire, um, but um, good uh, for astronomy in that um, they're not noise, they're not um, uh, useless and um, uh, useless for uh, useless in uh, as for astronomical images. Um, uh, destructive streaks um, on on images, but rather um, can be used to calibrate. Um, so, in order to uh, to do that, you need um, two things. One is a calibrated source itself. Um, another is you need to not have uh, significant. Um, reflection or background from uh, solar reflection um, if that's um, if that's a background uh, to um, although maybe in the future it can also be used as a signal because we do know now thanks to um, uh, studies such as the previous um, uh, study on solar swirls um, uh, a lot about the sun um, nevertheless um, it's uh, in order to have a calibrated source um, up there. Um, now, um, our, the very first satellite to do this um, is a satellite known as Orcasat, which is still in orbit, although only for another 10 days or so. Uh, it's at the last stages um, of its um, uh, of its orbit. It's going to burn up in the upper atmosphere in about 10 days. Um, it was launched um, by, um, on December 28th of this past year, um, or actually deployed um, from the International Space Station on December 28th. Uh, prior to that, uh, going backwards in time, it was launched from uh, Kennedy Space Center up to uh, the International Space Station a, a month earlier than that on November 26th uh, of this past year, 20, uh, 2022. Uh, and prior to that, it was constructed, of course, uh, constructed and calibrated in the lab. Uh, the construction mostly occurred um, here where I am uh, in the university campus where I am sitting, um, the University of Victoria um, uh, here in Canada. Um, uh, I'll be flying uh, down to um, Albuquerque tomorrow, um, but uh, I am now sitting north of the border. Um, in uh, in Victoria, BC, um, and um, so it was constructed in three years uh, from 2019 to 2022, uh, mostly on campus um, here, and uh, I'll show a little um, picture just to show how uh, what I'm going to show um, in a bit is the payload. Um, but I'll show a general picture of the internal structure um, of Orcasat first. Now, this is only 20 centimeters uh, long by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. It's so-called 2U CubeSat. Um, the, um, uh, this CubeSat was uh, funded by the Canadian Space Agency and the business end of it, uh, the payload contains a calibrated light source uh, so um, it would be nice if you um, just put a light bulb up there and you, you perhaps uh, could, but uh, for less, for a higher efficiency source um, and a more uh, monochromatic uh, source um, that is visible with uh, decent sized telescopes on earth, uh, we use laser diodes. So there are two uh, laser diodes sitting in this laser module one uh, red light, 660 nanometers, and one near-infrared, um, 840. And they are directed into what's called an integrating sphere. Integrating spheres are um, old, um, well, not uh, this one's quite new, but uh, they were developed in 1899. It's an old technology. Basically, it's a sphere with white paint inside. Um, and 
Um, white paint is um, is very good approximation to what's called a Lambertian reflector. And if you have a perfect Lambertian reflector and a perfect sphere, what happens uh, to any light source that gets shined into it um, is that on the first bounce, it bounces evenly around the sphere. Uh, and um, although the um, Lambertianness of any uh, coating, uh, the interior coating is not perfect, uh, the fact that the, the light tends to take multiple bounces uh, evens out the light even more. Uh, so the coating inside is basically, as I said, white paint. Um, be more specific, it's a barium, um, uh, barium sulfate paint. Um, and um, that's a BASO4, which is just very white, um, very white, um, uh, fancy paint, um, known as ABNB um, from a company in New Hampshire. Um, and uh, although um, it's just one, one manufacturer of uh, similar paints. Um, and uh, the critical uh, for science um, measurement of this, um, of the amount of light is done by these two photodiodes. Um, so uh, you know, we have, um, these are the photodiode readout, more photodiode modules, uh, mounted mount modules um, that um, uh, uh, measure the amount of light continuously while the light is on. Now, um, it might be nice um, to have the lights constantly be on, but we don't need that because um, it's not constantly, the satellite is not constantly being observed by telescopes. Um, in fact, it's um, the amount of light that comes out of this output port. Um, well, actually the total amount of light um, that um, the laser modules generate is about hundred milliwatts each. And uh, the photodiodes, um, so only about um, uh, 20 milliwatts or so of light actually goes toward Earth. But we know exactly how much light is going toward Earth. And we know the, um, the profile, which is approximately its cosine distribution. It's very, um, it's from the Lambertian reflector, you get a cosine distribution um, of light. So you know exactly how much light should, if there were no absorption uh, within the atmosphere, no scattering, um, none of that, and no, um, no loss in the optics of the telescope, nor in the detector, uh, you know how much light should be observed. Now then you measure how much light is observed and the ratio of those two gives you what's called a throughput, some number less than one um, that is the total throughput um, that, um, that, is, um, that you measure for that frequency of light. Now, why are we doing this? Um, so um, you'll hear um, later today, I believe, um, a, a public talk from Dan Skolnick on the expansion history of the universe, um, uh, which is um, uh, measured with type 1a supernovae, approximate standard candles or standardizable candles. Now, for the past 10 years, or actually a little over, uh, since about 2008, 15 years, um, the dominant uncertainty on uh, supernovae measurements of the expansion history of the universe has been uh, and is from photometry, astronomical photometry, um, the brightness magnitudes. How, what is the magnitude of the supernovae uh, as a function of their redshift? Now, um, that seems like a you know, simple thing to measure. Just get a calibrated source and put it up there. Well, um, this is a calibrated source, and this is the first such uh, such um, attempt to do that. Um, there um, now, um, um, I, I'm, um, uh, and I'll say just a little bit more about uh, this before um, before venturing into the future, which is the most important because this is just the beginning. Um, here is um, a, a, a photo of the deployment on December 28th of 
Orca set. That's the black colored uh, 2U cube set. This is another cube set uh, built by folks in Nova Scotia um, uh, for a totally different purpose uh, called Loris. But uh, here is Orca set being um, deployed uh, from, uh, from the ISS um, on December 28th. Um, and we have gotten so far one good image um, of um, of the streak. One good, we have a couple of images. Um, uh, all right, so this was taken on January 31st, um, and it's only part of the image, fortunately. We have uh, the whole long streak, um, and you're just seeing part of it here. Um, if um, this, if Orcasat were um, fixed in the sky, it would be as bright as a 14 magnitude star, 14 magnitude star. Um, so that's, you know, easy to see with, you know, just about um, any size telescope, but it streaks across the sky because it's in low Earth orbit. So its surface brightness of the streak is a lot dimmer. Um, the equivalent surface brightness of a PSF sized spot in this streak is of order, you know, 25 or 26 uh, magnitude. So it's it's dim. Um, so this image here was taken at the four meter uh, Blanco Norlab Blanco Telescope in Chile um, on January 31st um, of Orcasat in the middle of the night uh, with no um, uh, no background. You can tell that there's no background because the Orca satellite sources actually go on and off um, in order to be able to subtract off background. Now, um, I should, uh, so there, oh boy, uh, there's some construction here, um, unfortunately, um, but I'll talk over it. Um, the, um, uh, there have been many other attempts to, um, to uh, get uh, a, um, observations and a variety of, um, of, uh, uh, of misses due to wet, mostly due to weather, um, also due to the orientation of the satellite, um, the so-called ADCS um, on, on Orcasat initially had some issues and they persisted throughout, but, um, uh, occasionally also uh, operates perfectly as in this um, for the streak. Um, the one other image on March 4th that we got of Orcasat was a little too close to sunset. Um, so while well, we got a great streak um, from Orcasat, then the streak, the, the vast majority of the light in that streak was solar reflection off of uh, Orcasat because uh, while uh, the Blanc uh, it was another Blanco image, um, while Blanco, it was after sunset at Blanco, uh, up 400 kilometers um, above um, the, where Orcasat was, it was not quite sunset yet. The, the sun had not disappeared below the, the horizon from 400 kilometers. So it, um, it was, um, uh, it it, there, there was about 20 times as much um, uh, power, um, uh, light optical power coming off of solar reflection uh, than from the Orca satellite source itself. But once Orca sat is in eclipse, like in this image, um, the light is almost all, um, uh, um, we still have yet to do and publish um, the full analysis of this, um, but uh, almost all from, uh, from Orca sat. Um, so the future. So um, you, know, uh, you might think, and you're, you're basically correct that um, uh, CSA and certainly UVic um, are in the scale of space missions, a little pea shooters um, in this field, and they are. Um, now it's time to get out the big guns um, with, um, in terms of proper full calibration um, of uh, both photometry and also um, to do better versions of laser guide stars um, to improve PSF. Um, and NASA and NIST, the big guns, um, we are, um, are pioneering the, um, the um, future uh, for this. There's a, um, 
upcoming mission called Orcus, um, a, um, a similarly named, uh, but it'll be a very different uh, and much more powerful um, satellite than this uh, that will operate um, as uh, in a much higher orbit um, and be a calibration source uh, for both um, a photometry and uh, for PSF. So I probably am running out of time. Is that correct? Great, thank you, Justin. David, if you Thanks. wanna go ahead and share your slides now. Oh. Okay. Are you all seeing presenter view or are you seeing the regular slides? No, we're seeing your, your slides as they should appear. Okay, great. Um, am I good to go? Um, yep, you are great to go. Sorry, just okay. technical issues over here, but you are great. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dave Stark. I am a staff scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and I will be telling you about improved detection of satellite trails and Hubble imaging data. So um, just to lay the background here, when you take an image uh, with Hubble Space Telescope or really any telescope, you're subject to a variety of potential uh, artifacts in your data. These can include uh, cosmic rays, uh, diffraction spikes, uh, different types of scattered light. And in our modern era, um, as you know, was mentioned before in the last talk, uh, satellite trails. So these occur after a, um, a satellite in orbit above Hubble um, passes the field of view um, and uh, as we're exposing and leaves a streak across the image as you can see here. So these are of course not what astronomers are interested in looking at, they're interested in stars and galaxies and so on. So what I'm gonna talk about today is can we improve our automated detection of satellite trails so that we can then remove them from the data um, and now that we have a, a method of identifying them in an automated way, finding them throughout all the data over the years, we can start to explore how the properties of trails have changed over time, things like their rate and their brightness. So the new method that we employ to detect satellite trails is based on a, a computational method called the median radon transform. Now I am gonna give a very uh, non-technical description of what that is. Um, what we do with an image is if you, you have an image like this, um, what we do is we consider every single linear path that crosses that image. Um, and I'm just throwing, showing three here as an example, but you, we, you would uh, imagine that this, this whole image was covered with you know, paths that we're considering. And for each of these paths, you measure the median value of the data along that path. So the typical value. Now, most of these, uh, these different paths cover empty sky. And so the median value is gonna be about zero or the sky level. But if you have a satellite trail, eventually one of these paths across your data that you're considering will align with that trail. And the data along that trail will be elevated systematically above the sky level. Um, and so you'll measure a median value that's above zero or the sky level. Um, and so this is a, a key strength of this approach. The median radon transform is really optimized to find linear structures that have a consistent brightness um, above the sky. So if we consider all different trail, all different paths across our image, and we take the medians along each of those tracks, we can plot it as a map, which is shown here. Um, you do not really need to worry about the coordinate system here. What I want you to notice is that in the bottom left, there's this little bright spot. And that is the signal from the satellite trail in the median radon transform. So what the transformation is doing is it's taking very elongated uh, features in our images and collapsing, collapsing them down into point sources where they're easier to detect. So what we find is that this approach is actually a lot more sensitive than past approaches developed by uh, staff scientists here at Space Telescope. So we're able to detect uh, satellite trails with a mean brightness down to 0.1 times an image's noise level. So we can detect a satellite trail whose average brightness is one tenth of the random variations in the background of the image. So that's really digging down deep into kind of the weeds of your image there. Uh, the sensitivity is about five to 10 times better than the previous software developed to detect satellite trails that's been released by the Institute. 
So just to demonstrate this, um, I have an image here, another single exposure uh, taken by um, the Hubble ACS camera. Um, there is a satellite trail in this image. If you have a keen eye, you can see it, but it's difficult to see by eye. However, if we take the median rate on transform, there is a little point source on the left side here. Ignore the band here, the large sort of broad band there, but the little point source is the signal from the, the satellite. Um, and that pops out a lot more noticeably in the transformed uh, image. Um, and if I actually rescale the image above, you can see there is indeed uh, a satellite trail, but I have to be very, 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 very fine-tuned the scaling to see it. Um, so this just demonstrates that the this approach is really good at, at digging into kind of the weeds of your image to find these trails. And it is sensitive to things that are rather difficult to see by eye. So now that we've developed this algorithm, we apply it, we have applied it to 20 years of data from the advanced camera for surveys, wide field channel. And we find all the satellite trails that we can. And then we've examined the rate of satellite trail occurrence in the data and, uh, and how that have, has evolved. And then as well as the evolution and the typical brightness of satellite trails. All right, so here's what we find. In the last 20 years of Hubble ACS data, we found that the, the occurrence of satellite trails in the data has roughly doubled. Um, so what I'm plotting here on the left is the trail rate. So that's the number of trails we observe per hour. And on the right is the fraction of exposures affected. Um, so exposures, individual exposures that have a satellite trail crossing them. What we find is that in 2002, the trail rate was about 0.3. So that's a trail once every say three to four hours. It's up to now, in, as of 2022, it's up to about 0.6. So that's a trail, of, say, every one to two hours. Similarly, in 2002, um, the fraction of affected ex individual exposures was about 5%, and that's now up to about 10%. Um, the evolution in the typical trail brightness uh, doesn't tell a terribly interesting story. There are some year-to-year -year variations, but on average, it's remained about the same. Um, in the images. Um, I'll just note that this, this large error bar in 2007 and the plot on the right um, is just because of low number statistics. That is the year that the electronics um, failed on Hubble um, ACS. And so there are just fewer images to measure the mean brightness of trails. And so it leads to a larger error bar. There aren't actually more, there are not more bright trails that year. Okay, so what does this all mean for HSC science? Um, the big concern that, that astronomers have is, are the satellite trails affecting uh, the ability to do science with HST? Um, the good news is that in the vast, vast majority of cases, it does not appear to, be, to uh, cause, uh, so, excuse me, satellite trails do not appear to threaten our ability to do science with HST. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, one is that a single trail, uh, typical trails are relatively thin. Um, say five to 10 pixels wide. Um, a single trail will affect on the order of half a percent of the pixels in a single uh, exposure. For comparison, cosmic rays, which are ubiquitous and sort of uh, make pixels unusable all over your image, those affect three to six times as many pixels as an individual satellite trail. So really uh, uh, cosmic rays are the much bigger issue when you look at individual exposures. The other thing to keep in mind is that standard practice is to observe multiple dithered exposures of the same area on the sky, so that if, that if some pixels in one image are rendered useless by cosmic rays or a satellite trail, you have additional exposures of that same area of sky that you can then combine, and when you combine the images, um, you can effectively remove the, the influence of the satellite trail or cosmic rays. So I'm just going to show you an example here. This is a single exposure of the uh, front, one of the frontier fields. You can see there's a satellite trail. There's also cosmic rays all, uh, impacting all over this image. When we use our software to mask the satellite trail, then combine it with the other images of this field, you get this nice clean image where the satellite trail, which was on the bottom left, is no longer visible. So in the end, we can still do science even in the presence of these satellite trails. Um, so to summarize, we've developed a new method of identifying satellite trails and individual Hubble, Hubble exposures. Um, our approach is about five to 10 times more sensitive than prior routines developed to identify these trails. And we have applied this method to the last 20 years of ACS wide field channel data. 
uh, found that the rate of satellite trail presence has increased by roughly a factor of two. So originally 5% of exposures were affected, now about 10%. Um, but the typical satellite trail brightness has remained the same. And despite the increase, uh, satellite trails should not have any significant impact on our, on our ability to do science with HST. Um, if you have any more information, definitely check out the, the science report. Uh, um, I put the link there. Um, see the, uh, the poster I have up and feel free to email me. Thanks. Make sure we take this box away. All right, you're awesome. Good afternoon. I'm James Lowenthal from Smith College in Massachusetts, and also a member of the AAS Committee for the Protection of Astronomy and the Space Environment, COMPASS. And I lead the subcommittee on light pollution. We've just heard about a particular kind of light pollution that appeared on the astronomical scene significantly four years ago with the first launch of SpaceX Starlink satellites. But what I'm going to talk to you about more is the good old fashioned kind of light pollution that we've known about for a long time. And that's sort of been grinding away at the night sky for decade after decade for the last hundred years. You see this beautiful picture uh, taken by Dan and Cindy Durisco of uh, uh, Northern Arizona skies beautiful, pristine skies, uh, the, the stunning splendor of the Milky Way spread out like a blanket over uh, ancestral lands of Native Americans who have seen those skies for hundreds of thousands of years. The same skies that we need to study for practically everything that's taking place here at this meeting. But it's under threat from light pollution. One of my key points today is that we finally realize light pollution is not just an astronomy problem. We astronomers are sort of the canary in the coal mine. We have eyes on the sky. We know very intimately what the sky is like, what it used to be like, what it should be like, how it's changing. We measure it constantly. We are really the experts on the sky, but light pollution has a much broader set of effects problems, impacts. And we finally realize that to make any progress in combating light pollution, we need to work with other people who are much more concerned about things other than the night sky. For example, human health. Light pollution impacts human health. Light pollution impacts most life on earth, which has evolved, of course, over millions of years to have a 24-hour cycle of light and dark. Insects, fish, mammals, coral, migrating birds, almost every kind of animal we know, plants, trees, agricultural crops are affected negatively by light pollution. Practically every species that's studied is affected negatively. We also know that as light pollution slowly erases the stars, it's also erasing our cultural heritage and especially the cultural heritage of those people who still depend on viewing the night sky for connection with their ancestors with their religion, with their cosmology. Here's the really bad news, of course. Light pollution is growing worse, much faster than we thought it was. Just a year ago, most of us thought it was worsening at about 2% per year. But a recent paper by Chris Kaiba and his collaborators using citizen science observations around the world, 50,000 of them, finds that in fact, light pollution is getting worse by about 10% per year. This means that in a decade, most parts of the United States could lose thousands of stars from their sky, a rate of about one star per day, day after day after day, a steady drip of stars disappearing from our collective night sky. I think we're at a turning point, not only because of this dramatic rise in light pollution, which is largely due to the appearance of LED lighting, cheap bright, long-lasting 
energy efficient lighting that has sprung up in small and large communities around the world in the course of the last decade, but also because of our growing realization as dark sky advocates that this problem is not should not be limited to astronomy, that we astronomers need to work with people in the lighting industry. And we have finally learned how to do this and to work with people in ecological environmental conservation and in public health and in, in planning and in public policy and elected officials. We've learned a lot in the last couple of decades. We've grown much more savvy about this wicked problem and how to lick it. For example, the chart on the left these are the five principles of responsible outdoor lighting. This was developed by what you might consider our former enemies, the Illuminating Engineering Society, a sort of third party organization that sets standards or sets recommendations for what the lighting level should be on the, uh, the parking lot outside your business or the, the steps outside your, uh, your residential development. Uh, it's the body that most cities and towns around the United States turn to for recommendations. And we astronomers always felt, we dark sky advocates felt, oh, those, those lights, they're much too bright. You don't need them that way. You're not paying attention to the dark sky issue. Well, under visionary leadership, largely from uh, Dark Sky International, the former International Dark Sky Association, we've now come together and come up with this list of five values that practically everybody should agree with. Don't make the light too bright. Make sure the light has a purpose. Make sure it, it points only where it's supposed to point. Make sure it uses warm colors. Make sure it's on only when it needs to be. Who could disagree with that? No numbers in here, no money. You know, you, you could get a, a somebody to commit to this without having to suffer any pain. And so it's, a, it's an easy ask. And yet it puts the value out there of protecting natural darkness at night. We've learned a lot. It's taken a long time for us to get to the point of collaborating on this message. So this brings us now to the current incarnation of our uh, so-called Compass Committee, the Committee to Protect Astronomy and the Space Environment, ably led by my wonderful colleagues, Aparna Venkatesis and, and Tesni Pugh, who are here today. Uh, it's now grown just over the last several years, several fold to include the list of people you see here. This uh, growth happened largely because of the advent of mega constellations of low earth orbit satellites like the ones you just heard about. That's what really gave us the shot in the arm. We'd sort of just been uh, limping along for year after year uh, with the same old kind of light pollution. And then that crisis happened and it lit a fire around us, under us. And we've got a lot of fresh blood. It's, it's invigorated all of our efforts. And now we're really, um, we're really dealing with both of these parallel problems, light pollution from space and light pollution from the ground. So we recognize, we continue to recognize that perhaps the, the, the real killer problem is the light pollution from the ground. We, we could argue about which one is worth, worse. I think we, we all agree we actually have to deal with them both. I'm happy to say that I think we're also at a turning point in the following sense. At this meeting, uh, AAS 242, this is the largest devotion of concentrated time and effort and attention ever to this issue, to light pollution. We've never had three 90-minute sessions before at a AAS meeting. So here they are. Uh, it's a so-called meeting in the meeting organized by our colleagues at Flagstaff Observatory and the United States Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station, uh, who have been involved in dark sky efforts for many years. Uh, they've helped organize this meeting. It pulls together uh, X in, in uh, dark sky advocacy, regional planning, city planning, uh, astronomers, lighting professionals, politicians, to share the story of how Flagstaff has achieved its, uh, its award-winning control over its night skies and how that can be extended to other communities around the world. Uh, there are three sessions, as I said, the first one is, is talks uh, about the Flagstaff story and Coconino County, uh, which plays an, an equally uh, significant role. Uh, the second session is a, a couple more talks and a lot more discussion, uh, and we welcome you to join that. And then the third session uh, is expanding that view to uh, other parts of the, the nation, including New England, where I live, uh, and discussion of some of the efforts underway and uh, forward thinking, including a campus-based program that our committee is has taken the initiative to begin. I also invite you to attend tomorrow a, an open house that the that uh, Compass is, is holding, where we'll screen two documentary films from Minnesota and Maine on the dark sky advocacy uh, effort 
and, uh, and there'll be a lot of chance for open discussion. So please come and attend that. A little bit more about Flagstaff. Uh, you see the, the, the map on the left showing the county, Coconino County in Northern Arizona with Flagstaff at the Southern part of that county. Uh, and you see on the right, the light pollution map. And if you don't know this map, I encourage you to go to lightpollutionmap.info and dial in whatever part of the world you live in. See what the light pollution is like where you live. Uh, see where the dark parts are where you might wanna go vacation. And you'll see that there is an especially dark part in Coconino County. And the Southern part of that uh, is where flag is. The, the big bright blob in the middle of course is Phoenix um, and Albuquerque is the bright blob in the lower right. So that's where we are right now. Now, uh, zooming in closer to flag, what we see of course, is that there are two historic observatories there, uh, actually multiple observatories. And I would say two families of them now, uh, Lowell Observatory, uh, home to uh, the uh, uh, Discover Lowell, uh, uh, Lowell Discovery four and a half meter telescope, uh, and also the US Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station. This of course is most famous for being the, the site where uh, Percival Lowell uh, uh, discovered Pluto, but uh, very uh, active in, in cutting edge research to this day in most fields of, of astrophysics. It's because of the location of those observatories right next to uh, Flagstaff with a population of about 80,000 and, uh, uh, and the larger metro population within Coconino County that there has been such a long time effort since the late 1950s to protect the night sky against the creep of light pollution. And here you'll see a view of a city that you probably can't get anywhere else in the United States, a city of this size. Any other city, and most of us flew in uh, here to Albuquerque, so you know what I'm talking about. Any other city would be five, 10 or more times brighter than this uh, as seen from above. The light would be shining up, it would be poorly controlled, it would be bluer, it would be brighter, uh, but not in Flagstaff, not in Coconino County. Um, where uh, since the 50s, a coalition, an intergovernmental coalition and uh, an interdisciplinary coalition has worked hard, hard, hard over the decades uh, to write their regulations and to enforce them and to work with the, with the lighting designers to develop the products to, to show that it can be done to have the lights that you might feel you need in your city for uh, safety and security uh, without ruining the environment, human health and the night sky. Uh, this involves city council, uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation, uh, and private engineering firms, Chris Monrad's uh, based in Tucson, and the Metropolitan Planning Organization around Flagstaff. Here are some examples. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the city ordinance, just the beginning of it. You, know, you can look this up online. There are many cities in the world, uh, in the US included that, that have ordinances, but this is one of the, the best ones in the country and it's enforced. Uh, so this is a true model for how to do it right. And you'll see that they've included lighting zones. There's the map of the, the lighting zone system there. The dark brown is the most protected zone around the observatories, and uh, the yellow is the, the, uh, the rest of the area. Uh, also highly protected, probably better protected than 99% of uh, the lighting zone, uh, of the, the geographical zones most of us live in. Flagstaff was recognized for its efforts uh, 20, more than 20 years ago by the International Dark Sky Association, now Dark Sky International, uh, with its award of being the, the world's first international dark sky city. And uh, may that continue to, uh, to spread around many other cities around the country. And again, I just have to emphasize what a, a coalition this was. This was not just, it might've been led by astronomers in this case, but it was a coalition that included the city planners at every step of the way, the county planners and many other dark sky advocates who are not professional astronomers. Fortunately, it's not just happening in Flagstaff, it's happening around the country. We have on our committee, a devoted team of, of passionate defenders of the night. And uh, some of them are in my area in New England. And I'm happy to say that uh, in Maine, where uh, you'll see in the picture on the right, the light pollution picture, there's a dark blob in the upper right. That is one of the last remaining dark areas east of the Mississippi in central Maine. And for very fortunately, thanks to the hard work of um, numerous colleagues of ours, that is now protected as the Appalachian Mountain Club AMC Maine Woods International Dark Sky Park. Uh, just added in 2022. It joins the nearby Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument International Dark Sky Sanctuary. Uh, so I will leave you again with this 
uh, gorgeous uh, picture over the protective skies of Flagstaff and invite you to help in the effort to save dark skies everywhere. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's use our remaining time for some questions here in the room, starting with Alex. Thanks very much, Alex Witze, freelancer and correspondent with Nature. My question is for David Stark. You've talked about data up until 2022. What do your projections say about going forward? Like, what is the future rate of satellite trails on images? How is brightness going to play into that when the Starlinks become larger? And how does boosting Hubble's orbit, if that happens, play into these? Um, okay, so unfortunately, there are a lot of questions there I, I can't answer. Uh, so we have not yet done um, official predictions or extrapolations into the future. Um, what I can say is that right now, about one out of 10 images are affected. Um, if the rate of satellite trails were to say up, boost by a factor of 10, so that'd be you know a trail in roughly every, every image, we're still pretty confident that we can remove their effect, again, because they're relatively narrow and that they are, um, we take multiple images per field. And again, remember one satellite trail isn't affecting as many pixels as cosmic rays. So I can't give you a definitive answer on what things are gonna look like in the future. Um, but I think at least for the time being, and even if if the rate grows significantly, we're pretty confident that we can we can deal with the problem. Uh, I have a question for David Stark as well. Um, I'm on the WIFC3 instrument team. I'm an analyst. And I was wondering if the um, if you could tell me, uh, do the optical anomalies that um, ACS uh, exhibits, like uh, dragon's breath or column-wise blooming from excessive saturation, do those manifest in the median uh, radon transform? And if so, are they distinct enough from satellite trails that uh, that can be picked out automatically? Yeah. So, yeah, it is... Um... The median radon transform is very good at finding anything kind of linear. So it picks up um, some of these scattered light features, especially the glint. Um, I think I've seen it pick up the dragon's breath. It picks up diffraction spikes, like it's a great diffraction spike finder. Um, most of these are, you know, you can you can separate them out based on, for instance, with diffraction spikes angle. Um, with uh, some of these other features, they're very persistent across multiple exposures, and that's a very good way of knowing that they're not satellite trails. So there are ways to kind of filter them out from the analysis, which, which I did for my analysis. Um, hi, I had a question for James. Um, I'm Leah from the University of Canterbury. Um, and I guess I had a question about how viable you think dark sky preservation is in really large cities. Um, I've been living in Los Angeles for the last two months from New Zealand, so it's been a big jump. but is it ever viable to have a dark sky in a city like that? And do you think that there's like a maximum cap on when we can bother trying to preserve the dark sky, if that makes sense? Thanks for the question. Uh, I would say the the dark sky advocacy world is, is somewhat uh, divided on that issue. Uh, there are some who uh, would give up the big cities for lost already, is hopeless, why bother? Uh, but there are others who argue, uh, look, most people live in cities. People are, uh, those people are just as affected as everybody else, even more affected by the worst light pollution in those cities. From a public health perspective, we should be worried more about the cities. Uh, we might never uh, recover the Milky Way over New York City, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should pollute the skies of New York City with light wantonly. We've got one question up here in front. Do we also have some online? Okay. We'll take two more questions. I know we're running a little bit over. Yes, I had a question about Flagstaff. Has anybody done a comparison to see how much um, cost they've saved by lower light levels, perhaps with the uh, city government or whatever? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm sure somebody at this meeting does. And so I'm happy to uh, connect you with those people. Uh, Jeff Hall, uh, Fred Verba, there are a whole uh, slew of folks here from uh, from Flagstaff, not me, who will know those numbers. Okay, yeah, can we take one question from online? Is there a last one? We've actually only got two here. I think I could do this quickly. So the first question is, 
uh, from Matthew Gregory Henson, no affiliation listed. And this is for Juana. I, it's a little open-ended, but how do solar tornadoes twist in the sun and beyond? Okay. Um, so I mentioned before that solar tornadoes are rooted to the surface of the sun, which we call the, the photosphere. And they're rooted to, um, to a thing called the magnetic bright point. And that magnetic bright point ends up being jostled around by the neighboring granules. And then there's some conservation of angular momentum that happens. And so what you end up seeing is something similar to a sort of draining bath, like the draining bathtub effect. And then that causes the existing layers uh, above to also start in that sort of spiral tra trajectory. And so then the plasma ends up following the magnetic field lines, um, which results in the sort of twisting motion. And previous observations have shown that there's strong central upflows in the, in the central part of the solar tornado, which is how we know that it also moves upwards as well. Wonderful, thank you. And last question comes from Monica Young of Sky and Telescope. Uh, another question for David which is how do the new measurements of satellite trails and Hubble images compare to the report published earlier this year by Sandor Krug? Yeah, so uh, Sandor and company put out a nice study, which was um, uh, their method was to uh, use visual classification by citizen scientists to then train a machine learning algorithm to, to pick out uh, satellite trails and, image, and imaging data. Um, yeah, you know, just to be brief, because I mean, there's a lot we can sort of pick apart and the differences. But the nice thing is, actually, we we very much agree in the trends. Um, they also see roughly a factor of two increase in the the fraction of images uh, affected by satellite trails between 20, uh, 2002 and 2022. Um, but there's a systematic difference in the number of trails, the absolute number of trails we find. And I think that boils down to a difference in the sensitivities of the method. Um, their method is trained using uh, by eye identification. Um, whereas ours, we know can find things that are kind of embedded in the noise, where, which, which is hard to, things that are hard to see by eye. Um, but it's basically a different fraction of the satellite trail population that he's detecting versus what, what we're detecting. Um, and this, the distribution of satellite brightnesses appears to be relatively constant over the years. So it just manifests as a systematic offset in the, um, the absolute number, but not the trend as a function of time. Hope that answers right. the question. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So with that, let's draw this session to a close. Thank you so much to everyone for joining and to our speakers for their wonderful presentations. Yeah, one more round of applause for them. Thank you also to the PIOs who helped to prepare press releases today and to our sponsor, the University Space Research Association. We're going to be back tomorrow at 1015 and 215 with two more press conferences. And we have had a couple of schedule changes. So be sure to check out the press kit for the latest schedule and speakers. Um, so we hope to see you back here tomorrow at 1015 AM for resolving stars and hunting nearby galaxies. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>